Greetings, YouTube. My name is Jenny, and it is 10.31 a.m. on Saturday, August 6th, 2016. Um, primarily, I do videos about cross-stitch, but I have decided to branch out and do some stationary haul review videos in collaboration with a young woman from Australia named Chloe. She has a channel called Life with a Puppy, and I'll include a link in the description below so that you can go check out her videos. Um, initially, I found her the few videos that she's made when I did a stationary haul search on YouTube because I love watching haul videos for Lush products, stationery, and cross stitch. And she had done a couple of um, stationary videos. And after just leaving comments and speaking with each other, we decided we were going to do some collaboration videos. Um, I am an unabashed stationary addict, stationary pens, ink. I use fountain pens, um, which may make my first collaboration video a little strange, but I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I've always loved paper. My father worked in a paper mill as a technical director and engineer for 42 years. And even though his mill didn't produce like writing paper, he instilled a love of paper in me that to this day I still have. Um, you know, I was always using paper bags versus plastic bags at the grocery store, which it's so funny to me because now it's like grocery stores are going to start charging people to use plastic bags and paper bags are making a comeback. And it's like, well, I could have told you when I was a kid that paper is the way to go because you can reuse it, recycle it. Um, so paper has always been a very important part of my life. I was actually one of those strange kids who I loved back to school supplies shopping. You know, it didn't make me feel sad or anything about the start of school. I looked forward to being able to get my new school supplies. And also I was the kind of kid that when we were going on family vacation, I would want to go buy a new notebook and pen at the drugstore to take with us on vacation. Um, because I, you know, I would spend my time in the car writing stories, and of course I wanted to write about my vacation while I was there. Um, which also leads to a love of journaling. Um, I remember my first journal was one my grandmother bought me at Hallmark when I was 12 years old. And I can still picture it perfectly. It had like a cardboard cover. It was green. It had a horse on it. And that was, and it had one of those little jinky locks, you know, that you had to know the combination to open. And, um... That was my very first journal, and I still to this day journal. So paper and stationery and writing implements, it, it's one of my big obsessions as far as things that I buy. You know, I don't close shop very often, but I will go to the office supply store. I will go to Staples. I will go to my local office supply store, which is called AJ Hastings over in Amherst, and buy notebooks and pens and pencils, things like that. And I've got enough to survive the internet apocalypse as it is. But, you know, when we have to go back to actually writing things down because we can't use the internet or our smartphones anymore, I'll be set. And then I can sell some of my stationery and make a small fortune, but that's another story for a different post or a different video. Um, so when I saw that Chloe was as dedicated to office products and school supplies and things as I am, I was like, well, let's collaborate on stationary hauls. So my first one today that I want to um, show you some of my favorite products and then discuss them a little bit is regarding Moleskine notebooks. Now, there's quite a bit of controversy over Moleskines, especially within the fountain pen user community um, and in the community, in the writing community in lar at large, because their marketing is somewhat a touchy subject, and I'll go into that more in a minute. And the paper quality isn't that great. It's not consistent. There are some Moleskines I've had that have had pretty decent paper, and then some that I have that haven't. And you would think for someone who uses fountain pens, that wouldn't even be, that would just be, okay, why are you buying them? But for some reason, I still keep coming back to them. I'm actually collecting them. And I think it's because I like the size of them. I like the covers. Um, you know, I like that they do the special edition, different covers. And I don't know. I guess I'm just not a snob about paper to the point where I wouldn't say, oh, I'll never use one. The paper quality is not great, but I still write front and back on both pages sometimes, depending on what kind of pen I'm using. 
Um, some of my fountain pens I only write on the front, on the first, the front of each page. But others, you know, yeah, there's bleed through, and it's probably not the easiest thing to read after I write in them. But for some reason, I still come back to them. Now, first, I wanted to address the marketing. I think that the marketing of moleskins can be misunderstood, and I think it depends upon your interpretation of either moleskin with the capital M as a brand name or moleskin with the lowercase m as a type of notebook and just an adjective used to describe a notebook. Sometimes I think that's where the marketing can get a little bit misunderstood. They basically, in every moleskin, I don't know if this one still has the, let me check and see if I still have the little pamphlet in it. Each moleskin comes with the pamphlet. Well, that's, this is the recipe journal. Let's see. Okay, here it is. Each moleskin you buy, regardless of what kind of notebook it is, has this little pamphlet in it. And I'll read you the part that people find controversial. And I guess in a way I can see their point, but I don't think it's necessarily what moleskin is trying to say. But they give you this little pamphlet, and it's got the history of the Moleskine notebook. And I'll just, I'll just paraphrase here. The Moleskine notebook is the errant successor to the legendary notebook used by artists and thinkers over the past two centuries, among them Vincent van Gogh, Pablo Picasso, Ernest Hemingway, and Bruce Chatwin. A simple black rectangle with rounded corners, an elastic page holder, and an internal expandable pocket. A nameless object with spare perfection all its own. The notebook was Bruce Chapman's favorite, and it was he who called it Moleskine. In the mid-80s, these notebooks became increasingly scarce and then vanished entirely. In 1997, a small Milanese publisher brought the legendary notebook back to life and selected this name with a literary pedigree to revive an extraordinary tradition. Now, I think sometimes people read that as saying that Hemingway and Picasso and Bruce Chapman used moleskins. Well, no, they didn't because moleskins, they weren't a brand. Well, they, they, were, they were not a brand when any of those creators used them. What they mean is the small end moleskin, and that's what Bruce Chapman meant. He called it a moleskin notebook, and then they took the name and made it the trademark. But I think sometimes people feel like, well, why do you have to name drop? If your notebook is good enough, why does it matter what celebrity writers and artists used it in the past? But, you know, to me, saying that Bruce Chatwin and Ernest Hemingway used Moleskine type notebooks, that's no different than a celebrity athlete endorsing a sports drink or something. I mean, if you, if you go and you buy Gatorade, are you really going to be able to slam dunk like Kobe Bryant? No but they want you to think that you can so that you go buy the product. If you use one of these notebooks, are you going to write the next, you know, farewell to arms? No, probably not. But, you know, I mean, it's just marketing in general, folks. It's not, I mean, marketing tries to convince you to buy things you don't need. You know, things you want that you don't need. So, you know, throwing down Picasso or Hemingway's name, that's, you know, so I can see why some people think that's a bit touchy, but it's just marketing. I mean, you know, I know good and well when I use these that I'm not going to turn into the next Pablo Picasso. I'm not a graphic artist. Um, you know, I know that I'm not going to write the next earth-shattering novel like Hemingway did, but I'm also not going to go commit suicide with the shotgun after I've led a depressing life like Hemingway did either. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to make light of, of Hemingway's demise, don't take me wrong, but I just think that some people get so hepped up with the marketing that they're like, well, why would you want to buy a notebook that obviously, you know, is deceptive advertising? Well, it's not deceptive advertising. They're not saying that Hemingway used a Molsky notebook in, in the fashion of these notebooks here. Um, they're saying he used one. It was a hardcover notebook. It had a pocket in the back. It had a little elastic thingy on it to keep it shut, you know, and that's when the Moleskine brand revived itself. That's why they took the name because Bruce Chatwin was enamored of these Moleskine type notebooks. Um, I don't think we really know why Bruce Chatwin called them Moleskines. It was just, that was the phrase he came up with and it stuck and then Moleskine notebooks took that as their trademark and their 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 um, 
their name for their product. So I don't find the marketing squidgy at all. I know some people do, but I think that's just been misunderstood and misrepresented. Uh, the one thing that I do agree with, with the controversy or the debate on whether or not you should use moleskins is the paper quality is not that good. But it works fine if you don't use um, fountain pens. And I know a lot of people in the fountain pen community have been alienated from moleskins because the paper quality is not good. But for some reason, I keep using them. I mean, I know that the paper quality is not that good, but I, there's just something about a moleskin notebook that makes me love them despite their flaws. You know, I mean, nobody's perfect and no product is perfect. There are other notebooks that I've used that have far better paper for fountain pens that the covers are flimsy or the binding isn't quite right and they fall apart easily. So, you know, every product is going to have some kind of flaw and paper quality is probably the only flaw in the mole scheme. Um, now, some people say, well, it's 20 to 20 to $30 for a notebook or a planner or a sketchbook. You know, it, it, the price range, it depends on the size of the notebook. I think I would say, like, the price range for most schemes goes from, like, $15 for the smaller notebooks up to $25, maybe for the hardcover ones that I use. And, yeah, I, if, you, if you're going to spend that kind of money on a notebook, I know you want quality paper. So I can understand that part of most schemes' quality control issues that people have a problem with. But, like I said, I can't really say why it doesn't bother me. It's just, it doesn't. And I have more moleskins in my collection than probably any other notebook brand. Um, there's a lot of notebooks that I use, a lot of notebook systems and things that over the coming videos in my collaboration with Chloe that I will be talking about. Um, I'm not going to do official reviews and show, you know, paper samples and writing samples on it because there are people out there who do these kind of videos far better than I do. I just want to talk about my favorite office supplies and stationery and why I love them. Um, and I have to admit, for me, the reason I love Moleskines is because they're kind of kitsch. They kind of look cool when you're carrying one. And not that I'm like trying to be a hipster putting on airs and saying, oh, look at me, I'm a writer, look at me. I just kind of like the look of the notebooks. And I also like the fact that they have limited edition covers. Not, not exactly limited edition because you can probably still get some of the ones that they've done in the past, but they've done really cute little, they did a Lego collaboration with Lego where they put actual Lego bricks on the cover of the, on the cover of the Moleskines. And then you've got a little Lego guy you could actually stick to your Moleskine if you wanted to. And they've done like peanuts planners. There's a cute little Snoopy one, but I don't use planners. So I wouldn't be buying that particular Moleskine. But I just feel like it's just something different. It's something that sets you apart. I mean, it, then there's nothing wrong with using a spiral notebook or a composition book. I use plenty of those too, but I just kind of like the look of a mole scheme. So I thought I'd show you some of my collection and just tell you why I like these notebooks. Um, the first one that I have here is the small, It's this is like the small pocket size mole scheme that you can buy. And I would never buy these for anything other than just like making grocery lists on or something thrown in my pocketbook because I write so big, a notebook of a certain size isn't going to be helpful to me. But what I use this one for, this one is my computer password notebook, which I keep here on my desk because I used to be one of those annoying people who tech support geeks probably wanted to smack up the side of the head because I use the same simple password for every website that I visited. And it wasn't secure because it didn't have numbers, it didn't have a capital letter in there somewhere, it was just the same word. And I'm sure that I'm like the bane, I was the bane of tech support's existence back then because I could have been so easily hacked. So once I realized how important it was to have specific passwords for every website that, you know, had numbers and letter combinations and things, I realized I was going to have to start writing my passwords down so that I could actually remember them. So anytime I go to a website and I create a new password or anytime I have to change a password, you know, like every six months on my bank's website, I have to change my password. So anytime 
I have to do something like that. I write it in this notebook and it has saved me a lot of grief in trying to remember all these because my passwords are a lot more complicated than they used to be. So this is a little Moleskine. It's nice and I mean you could use it to write in if you have small handwriting. It's got the same feature that the full-size Moleskines have. It's got the pocket in the back where you can stick stuff and it's got the elastic band and they come in all different kinds of colors. This one's a pretty like almost like houndstooth cloth cover, cloth cover, which I like. So that one stays on my desk. And the next Moleskine I have, they do have specific editions for different kinds of aficionados. Like they have a wine notebook where if you're a wine aficionado and you want to keep specific details of wines you've had and things you like about them, um, they've got I can't remember all the ones they have, but they have specific editions. And this one is a Moleskine recipe book. And I don't think it's going to show up very well on my webcam just because the lighting in here and all that stinks. I think going forward, I'm going to try to use my digital camera, video camera on my digital camera to, to um, make videos. So we'll see. I've never tried to use a digital camera to make videos before, so but I'm going to try that the next time. But this has like a knife and a fork and a glass and a cheese grater and all that it embossed in the cupboards. And it's the same concept. Um, it's got the pocket in the back. But what I like about this notebook is that it's divided up into different sections. Um, it came with these stickers um, that have like finger foods, sandwiches, preserves, jams, pickles, starters. Ready in five, mom's recipes, uh, religious festivals. So any kinds of recipes that you might want to keep in a cook in a recipe book, um, you've got these stickers, and I've used a few of them because I really I'm a baker. I'm not a cook per se. I'm, I'm more of a baker. So they've got tabs, and you know they've got some tabs already in there. They've got appetizer, first course, main dish, side dish, desserts. And desserts is the one that I use because I, like I said, I'm a baker. So I broke it down into um, cookies and snacks because I do have a couple of recipes for like cheese biscuits and things. And then when you flip to a page where you're going to put a recipe, um, all the pages are numbered. And what I like is it has place to put the title of the recipe, the ingredients, then it's got the preparation, um, then it's got like if you have, if there's alcohol content, how many, like if you're doing cooking as opposed to baking, um, alcohol content, how many people it serves, what the ideal occasion to serve it would be for, um, any kind of tools you might need, any kitchen gadgets you might need, and the amount of time it takes. So, I mean, it's really a very neatly put together book. I have not used it to its full potential because, like I said, I'm not a chef. I'm a baker, which is a totally different thing. But, like, here you can see I have written my grandmother's um, peach crumb pie, which is basically a peach cobbler, which I don't even follow the recipe when I make it anymore because it's simple enough. You don't have to. But, like, for my grandmother's pound cake, so um, it's got difficulty of the recipe, how long it takes to make it, um, prep time. It's like 20, 30 minutes prep time, and it takes an hour and 15 minutes to bake the cake. And then um, cooking process, which stove, microwave, or your oven. Um, wine pairings. Well, if, you drink, if you're having cake with wine, more power to you kind of sounds. And then notes, and I wrote, this is a family tradition served on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day dinner with a cherry jello swirl. Um, and then I've listed the ingredients and how you bake it. And you know, I've got my grandmother's peach crumb pie recipe. I've got old-fashioned vanilla frozen custard from Cook's Country magazine, which I have not tried yet. Summer got away from me before I could try to make the ice cream. But if I can make the Cook's Country or the Cook's Illustrated Mississippi Mud Pie, I can make the I can make the ice cream. I just haven't yet. And like over here under snacks, I have my grandmother's um, cheese cheese biscuit wafers, 
which are like little cheese cracker. <laughs> well, they're not exactly cracker consistency. They're more like a cookie consistency, but they're cheese crackers. And I have that recipe, which I'm going to go to a lot this year for football season so that I can um, take snacks for the, because where we watch from, where we watch the game from the coaches' wives, we don't have that much good stuff to munch on during the game. So I'm going to bake those. And then there was seasoned oyster crackers. I don't even remember why I put that recipe in there. Probably because I like oyster crackers for soups and I thought that I could but it's like, you know, seasonings and you toast them. And so this is a really nice little, the recipe journal is a really nice little mole scheme. And it keeps everything together in a compact little notebook. I still have to write a couple of recipes in there, but you know, it's nice. It's a nice setup for um, keeping your recipes organized. So that one is another mole scheme that I use a lot. Now, the following moleskines are just journals that I have that I haven't used and I primarily I use them for two reasons. I do keep a daily journal. Um, I do I try to write in it every so often. I lately with all my stuff going on, if I've written once a week, I'm fine. Um, but I do have a line a day journal that helps me keep up with my daily journaling. So I use these for that, and then I also use them. I have one that's actually in my car now. It's a Star Wars one that I'm using because when I blog, I keep a handwritten copy of every blog, po blog post I make. Um, I think part of that comes from when my family got our first computer. I was in eighth grade, and I was a writer even back then. I've been a writer for most of my life since I could pick up a pencil and make up a story. But back then, I think we just didn't appreciate how fast technology was going to change. Because, I mean, at the time that we had our first computer, it was cutting edge. But it was like one of those gigantic computers that had the five and a quarter inch floppies and the monochrome screen. And, you know, our printer was a dot matrix printer that made all that noise. And you had to line the paper up perfectly on the gears on the side of the thing to make it work. Um, and I think my mother probably has some of the stories that I wrote and printed out, but I saved everything to floppy disks because who knew back then that a floppy disk would be completely obsolete in a couple of years? Because even back then, after a while, you started using those hard disks, three inch or the three and a quarter inch disks, you know, those little hard plastic ones. And even those didn't last because then there was, you know, CD ROMs and all that stuff. and. I think that the reason I handwrite out everything I post on my blog is just because I want to have handwritten copies because who's to say how we'll access the internet in the future or who's to say that it'll even be there. I mean, yeah, the cloud's great, but what happens when the cloud becomes obsolete? So yeah, I'm kind of a throwback because when I'm coming up with the blog post, I handwrite it out and then I post it. And then if I've got a picture in a blog post, I print that out and I, you know, cut cut it and tape it into my journal and write out the blog post. So that's primarily what I use my most scheme journals for. Um, my current blog post journal is Boba Fett. He was my favorite Star Wars villain because he was, I mean, if you think about it, the Emperor was a power hungry politician. Darth Vader was someone who let emotion blind him and turn him evil, which, you know, happens a lot with people in today's society. They get swept up in passion and emotion, and then they go crazy, and, you know. But Boba Fett was the one who was just a mercenary. He was just out for himself, out to make money. You know, he was out to, you know, hey, you want me to go kill Han Solo? You want me to bring him back to you in carbonite? as your trophy? Sure. How much are you going to pay me? So to me, that makes Boba Fett one of the more badass Star Wars villains. Even though he kind of met a rather silly end when Han Solo accidentally kicked him into the Sarlacc pit. But, so I have that one, but that one's in my car. So, I inadvertently got into collecting the Star Wars mole schemes. Um, and I will eventually use all of these. I think I'll probably make this, the Star Wars ones my blog posting notebook collection. So like I said, I'm currently using the Boba Fett one, but I'm almost finished with it. And then I've got the classic Star Wars Darth Vader. I just like the look of this notebook. I will admit to you, 
I buy moleskins mostly for the way they look. Because they just look cool. I mean, who doesn't want a Darth Vader, you know, force choke holding someone notebook? I mean, this is cool. It marks me as a child of the, the 80s and totally channels my inner sci fi movie geek. But, you know, I kind of feel a little bit cool when I carry these kind of notebooks. I mean, they're all the same basic design. It's just the covers are different. You know, they all have the... Now, the thing I like about the Star Wars ones is they actually have end papers, illustrated end papers, because this is the illustration on the inside. And, of course, every Moleskine notebook has a, you know, in case of loss, please return to as a reward, you know. And depending on what I had in my notebooks, I would pay someone to return it to me if... You know, but like if I lost one of my blog post notebooks or something, it would mean enough to me I would pay someone to, you know, so I do always fill that out because if I lost one of my notebooks, I would really be upset. Probably not as much as if it was a notebook I was using for my daily journaling because I see those notebooks as kind of like my legacy to leave to my niece and nephew, and that would kill me if I left one of those somewhere, but anyway, if you're worried about losing your moleskin, but first of all, blown up. Death Star. Pretty freaking sweet, I would say, right? And the back end paper is the Hoth Ice Battle with the Adats and the, the Chicken Walkers. Well, those are just all Adats. They don't. Where is that? No, they, they're all Adats, but still, one of my favorite scenes. I think I think the Hoth scene is one of my favorites in the, Star, in the classic Star Wars trilogy. So when they do the specialized notebooks, they do add up, jazz it up a little bit. So that's the Darth Vader one. And they did do a release of some notebooks for The Force Awakens, of which I have BB-8. And I have to say, BB-8 may have surpl surplanted, uh, surplanted, is that even a word? I don't know if that's even a word. But he may have, he may have well pushed R2-D2 out of my favorite Star Wars character. Because BB-8 was so cute. Just too cute. My nephew got a little BB-8 robot for Christmas that he could control with his mom's smartphone. Just so adorable. So I do love BB-8 more than I love R2 now. And R2 is always one of my favorites because I always felt like R2 was so misunderstood. You know, he was probably one of those characters where it's like, are you listening to me? Listen to me! You know, I always felt like he was trying to tell people stuff and that they would go to C-3PO because they couldn't understand R2 and poor little frustrated R2. But I think BB-8 is my new favorite. He's just so adorable. So on the inside, I absolutely love this end paper. BB-8 and C-3PO. I still don't get why they gave C-3PO a red arm. They never explained that. And to me, if you're going to totally muck with the way a char an established character looks, you better explain why. But, and then of course the back end paper is just the star feel. But I love BB 8. And I'll admit I bought this one for the cover too. Um, and I didn't exactly entirely intend to get the entire Star Wars collection. Now they do have a Kylo Ren and a Stormtrooper from The Force Awakens, but I just. I have classic Star Wars, with the exception of BB 8 and classic Star Wars all the way, which explains my last one X Wing Fighter Pilot Luke. I just thought that was cool because that's kind of a throwback. That's why I got this one because this, I am a Star Wars purist. Episodes 4, 5, and 6, the un messed around with version, which you can bear, you can hardly ever find the, the un-digital remastered version anymore, which makes me mad because I grew up watching the cheesy 4, 5, and 6 from the 70s and early 80s, and those are the ones that, those are the movies that I like the best, but... So, of course, you got the TIE Fighters. I mean, that one's pretty cool. I like the end papers in these. And then, of course, Millennium Falcon. Who else sobbed their eyes out when Han Solo died in Force Awakens? My sister, it was funny, because I saw The Force Awakens last year um, before the Christmas holidays. I saw it, like, within a few weeks of it coming out. And my sister was like, no spoilers, no spoilers, I don't want to know. So I didn't tell her anything. And then she got mad at me and she texted me, why didn't you tell me Han Solo died? I was like, because you said you didn't want any spoilers, so I wasn't going to spoil it for you. 
So those are my Star Wars Moleskines, and I have to admit, these are my favorites. These are probably all going to be my blog post notebooks. Um, now, the only other one I have as far as character related is this Batman one. Now, I'm not a comic book fan by any means. Um, I'm not... I don't, I'm not into going to all those Marvel comic movies. I mean, my husband sort of is, depending on the characters who are in it. Now, I will say, if I had to choose between Marvel and DC, I would choose Marvel because Marvel had more women superheroes. Now, granted, I realized uh, Catwoman, was, Catwoman was a female villain from the DC comics, and then you had Batgirl, and you had Wonder Woman. And my husband and I, when we were watching Batman vs. Superman, I was asking him, I was like, well, were there any other standalone female comic book heroes in the DC Universe? Um, because Wonder Woman, you know, she was an Amazon and all that, so she had her own story, and she was her own character. But Batgirl was Commissioner Gordon's granddaughter, and um, Supergirl was Clark Kent's cousin or something. So, I mean, were there any standalone characters that didn't depend on the men, was my point. And in DC Comics, no, there weren't. Just Wonder Woman. She was the only truly female, truly female, um, she was the only truly female super superhero who didn't have to have a man as part of her backstory, which is, I kind of think, why I prefer Marvel Comics. I mean, now, granted... In the Fantastic Four, she was married to Mr. Fantastic, but, you know, she was part of the story and could stand on her own if she had to. And uh, look at all the female characters from the X-Men. They all had their own stories that didn't depend on a man being related to them or something like that for them to be a superhero. So that's why I kind of tend towards Marvel Comics if I had to choose. And I choose Batman because I just love the fact he was a vigilante. He did not have any kind of superpower whatsoever. Everything Batman had, he had the money, he had it made. He and Alfred made all his stuff. You know, they made the Batmobile, they made the Batarangs. You know, everything he had was a gadget that he invented to help him fight crime. It wasn't like Superman being an alien or Peter Parker getting bitten by a radioactive spider or David Banner, you know, getting messed up with gamma radiation and became the Hulk whenever he got ticked off. Bruce Wayne was someone who lost his parents to a violent crime and just decided, okay, forget that. Criminals, I'm going to kick your butt. And he was wealthy enough he could. Now, I do like the homage to the old school bat signal. I suppose I shouldn't show you my phone number. <laughs> but... The homage to the old school bat signal in the Gotham. Now, the one thing I did not like about Batman versus Superman, Metropolis and Gotham were not neighbors. Sorry. Metropolis was Chicago. Gotham was New York. Totally separate. But Bill explained to me they were trying to do it like a New York, New Jersey kind of thing so that they could make the Batman versus Superman thing more. And then in the back, it's like Gotham and Flames, and you got the bat signal. So I like this one because I like Batman. Haven't used it yet, even though I put my, my info in there. This might be one of my personal journals, eventually. And then the last ones that I that I have that are the themed ones. And these I just thought were kind of cool because they're hard, it's hard to find red moleskins. And I just liked the... I haven't opened this one. I'll go ahead and open this one. Um... And, you know, I mean, you, you could say that a cool cover or something cool is a stupid reason to buy a notebook because you should care more about the paper than the notebook. But, you know, I'm all about the bling and the look and, yeah, I'm kind of silly that way. So, the last ones I bought are Coca-Cola branded notebooks. And these were the two cooler of the three. I actually sent one of the Coca-Cola notebooks to a friend of mine in the Netherlands, but... First of all, there's very few, unless you just buy the plain red moleskins. That's just cool looking, because it's the straw, you know, it's like the old school paper straws in the Coke bottle. And I think there's something nostalgic about this. Um, this is the one that I'm writing my work memoir in. So it's a wonder this thing hasn't burst into flames yet. But I've already started writing in it. I basically outlined the two sections of the memoir and all the different chapters. And on this one, I haven't been writing 
I just have been using a, just a gel pen, so there's no problem with the paper. I think you're fine with the paper as long as you don't use fountain pens, but I still use my fountain pens in them. But I think if you're really that worried about the paper, then just use ballpoints. Or, and then this one was the other Coca-Cola limited edition. And I just thought this one was kind of cool because it's kind of like hippie, sort of, but the designer just did a really cool job. It's the 100th anniversary logo for Coca-Cola. For Coca and this one I think has, let me see, I think this one had Coca-Cola stickers in it. Sometimes the limited edition ones do. I don't remember if this one did or not. No, this one did, no, did this one? No, this one didn't. It just had the end papers with the Coca-Cola bottles on them. I think the Batman one had stickers. I can't remember. Yeah, the Batman one had stickers. The Batman one had stickers that remind me of the 60s TV show, and it's so freaking funny because my father was a fan of the original Dark Knight comic books, and the TV show came out when he was in college. And he, he told me that he and his friends got together and were going to watch it. And like in the first 10 minutes of the show, they were like, what the heck is this? And he never watched another. But these like these stickers remind me of the TV show. And then you can't see them because they're black stickers, but they're the Batman, different versions of the Bat logo over the years. But I still have to say in the Batman movie lexicon, until Ben Affleck played him, my favorite one was Michael Keaton from the original Tim Burton one. Now, if they had stuck with Tim Burton, the first two movies from 89 and the other one, with the one with uh, Danny DeVito and Michelle Pfeiffer. I mean, Michelle Pfeiffer was perfect for Catwoman, even though crazy, what's her name? Um, who's that actress? Sean Young thought she should have been Catwoman and went crazy trying to get the... All you have to do is Google Catwoman 19... Or Google Michelle Pfeiffer and Catwoman or some kind of thing like that, and you can read the story about Sean Young and how she showed up on the on the set in a full handmade Catwoman costume because she thought she should be the cat she should be Catwoman. It's a whole crazy story, but I'm digressing into a comic book fandom that I don't even really have, but I have to admit I don't. But I do like Batman. But Michael Keaton was really good, and I think Tim Burton had the creep factor to make it dark like it should have been. The first two, I find the first two Batman movies ever made in my lifetime were very creepy and atmospheric to the whole kind of Dark Knight thing. And Michael Keaton did a good job of playing like this kind of slightly disturbed man who was on the edge. Um, could have done without Kim Basinger as Vicki Vale, but she was hot back then, so she was a hot actress. Everyone wanted her to be in their movies, so. Um, but Michael Keaton was probably the best, and I think Ben Affleck kind of, I think he picked up the mantle. I certainly didn't like the Joel Schumacher Batman films because it became too much like the 60s TV show. You know, I think Joel Schumacher took it to a level of where it was like putting the whoever it was who played the Riddler on the TV show, you know, and kind of cartooning it up a bit. I like the ones that Tim Burton did the best. And I have to admit, the Dark Knight trilogy, if you want to talk about the ones that are closest to actually what the Dark Knight was supposed to be about, the ones that Christian Bale played Batman are probably closest to the actual comic book, um, the actual Dark Knight series. Um, but yeah, again, I'm talking about comic books like I know what I'm talking about. But this, um, I love this Coke bottle one. And this one has some interesting stickers because it has mouths with teeth that look like Coke bottles. And I'm not even sure what those little, oh, those little splooshes. That's actually what the other notebook looks like, which is why I didn't get it because I just didn't like it. But it's all these Coke bottles that look like they're made out of paint kind of coming out of a... So that's, that's why I didn't get the other one, because I just didn't like the way that one looked. And then Coke bottle stickers. So every once in a while when you buy a mom scheme, if you buy a limited edition, they have stickers or something in there. I think my Lego one, which I could not find, it's buried somewhere in here, I'm sure, was uh, one that it had a little Lego guy, but it also had um, some stickers.
So these are all the typical, you know, moleskine hardcover notebooks, but there are other kinds too. And when I'm just basically working on starting a new story or something, I tend to like these. Now these are the cahiers, which cahier is French for notebook. Um, they come in packs of three and they're 20 bucks, but you get three really sturdy cardboard covered notebooks. Um, <coughs> excuse me. These are plain ones, but they come in lined as well. And I think these tend to have better paper, honestly. Um, I've used these before. And I actually have one notebook that I kept a bunch of writing prompts and ideas in, and I go back and use it every once in a while. And even though it's a few years old, it still held up pretty well. So, you know, these are pretty sturdy cardboard stock. And they hold together pretty well. Now, um, these I would use for any number of things. I like paper seems a bit more sturdy although it is it is rather thin paper but it seems to be a little bit better than the hardcover ones and they do have the pocket in the back the only thing is is it's not an enclosed pocket so I wouldn't put anything in these that you, you know don't want to just have possibly slip out but I use these kind of notebooks to draft um, to draft blog posts uh, like I said, I always handwrite things out because I just think better when I'm handwriting. And there have been a lot of conclusive scientific studies saying that your brain, you pick things up and retain things better when you write them down. And it's so funny because I read this thing about even doodling. You may look like you're not paying attention if you're doodling, but you're actually engaging more with your brain and able to retain things better than if you just sit in a meeting and just sit and stare at, you know, the person who's leading the meeting or whatever. And I remember one time I was such a smart aleck. It's a wonder my mouth doesn't get me in more trouble than it does. But I was at a office meeting and it was a few years back. And I was sitting there and, you know, I mean, a lot of it didn't pertain to me because at the time I wasn't a paralegal yet, so it didn't pertain to me anyway, but it was a unit meeting. And I was sitting there just doodling on my notepad. And the supervisor called me out and said something about, well, you're quite the artist or something. And I shot back and I said, hey, it's been proven that if you doodle, you retain more information than if you don't. And I was like, I walked out of the meeting and I was like, oh my gosh. Did I really just say that? Because I'm going to get myself in trouble. I didn't, thankfully. But, you know, every once in a while, I'm a little bit of a smart aleck, and it's just, it doesn't usually end well for smart alecks. But, yeah, I'll use these in the place of, like, a notepad to um, plan out blog posts. Or, you know, I use these sometimes to keep my finished copies of my blog posts in them. Um, these are nice. I these this size is nice. They do make one that's a massive one that I I bought one and then I never used it because it was just so stinking big. It was bigger than these. And these are just you know typical notebook size, you know, like a composition notebook size. So that's it for the moleskins that I have now. Like I said, I've got enough stationery to choke a horse, and I probably should just I could stop buying stationery today and be fine well into my 80s. You know, but I don't know. I mean, if I have stationery I'm not using, I do give it away. I've given a lot to my niece and nephew because I tried to get them a love of writing things out and all instilled in them. And so far it's worked. Uh, now the sad thing is, is that kids today don't use paper in school anymore. My niece and nephew both have um, a Chromebook that's assigned to them at the beginning of the year and they keep it and do all their homework. You know, they submit all their homework through the computer. And I gave my nephew a nice fountain pen last year for Christmas. And he said, well, Aunt Jenny, this is great, but I don't write much anymore. And I was like, well, you know what? Neither do I because I work in a paperless office, but I still use my pens every day. I find ways to use my pens. And we talked about, you know, you can journal. You can write yourself notes. You know, you can, you can find ways to use stationery, even if it's not something that's a part, a permanent part of your daily life. And... You know, someday the internet's going to go kerblooey and half the people I know won't be able to communicate with each other anymore. So I prefer to keep, and you know, I mean, of course, the whole controversy over kids, do they learn cursive or do they not? Well, 
a lot of people might say there's no point to learning cursive anymore. All they're ever going to do is type. But I think that keeping those kind of old school things alive is important because it's not so much that you'll have to write a note to somebody, you know, when you can just email them or text them or something. But I think it's a part of what makes us human. You know, from the very beginning, the most ancient cultures learned how to write. And I was watching a PBS documentary, it was actually a National Geographic thing on PBS, and it was about the Greeks. And they were talking about what set the Greeks apart from cultures that came before them was that when they wrote, they wrote for pleasure and for creativity. Because if you look back at like the ancient Babylonians and the Sumerians, and when they wrote, they um, used their writing skills. First of all, not everybody knew how to write. Um, it was basically the priests and, was, and the financial people in the higher up parts of the government that knew even how to write. But that their writing was all ledgers. It was all, you know, how much was in the temple granary and how many taxes they collected and what regions they collected them from. But that the Greeks, you know, that like Homer and Aristotle and, and you know, all the, the, the Greek, the famous Greek writers, they were writing to promote thinking, you know, the philosophers. They were writing to promote beauty, the poets. You know, they, they wrote for pleasure. And I think that that's something that we can't let die out just because we use computers now. I mean, yeah, okay, I have a blog, but I also keep a handwritten copy of my blog posts because what if something happens and the blog goes away? You know, then I won't have any written trace of anything I ever did. And I think for me, I view writing, um, handwriting as a way to preserve humanity. Because, I mean, let's say 10,000 years from now, if the Earth is still spinning and there's still evidence that we were ever even here. You know, yeah, it's great. They can access our computers and see what we did. But wouldn't it be fascinating like we do with archaeology where we go into these caves where we find like the earliest known cave art, you know, from six, seven thousand years ago. You know, and we go in and we find this where people were just starting to express themselves creatively. So, and I kind of look at a notebook as something more tangible to leave behind of myself after I'm gone. I mean, yeah, my blog will be there forever. So, 100 years after I'm dead, if the internet's still around and people can access my blog, they'll see that at one time I was a writer and I did my thing. Um, and I know that that's a, an interesting part of the internet where it's talking about, you know, I've heard things on NPR about, you know, people trying to capture their, their soul and things and like upload it to the internet and all this crazy stuff. But to me, I think handwritten would be more a part of who I am because I'm not a very technologically based person. I mean, I am, I'm sitting here making this video. Um, and I'm talking to you about handwriting things and notebooks and why I use these kind of notebooks. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the kind of person who jumps at the next technological upgrade or whatever. I don't have a smartphone at all. I have a cell phone, but it's a little flip phone thing that all it does is text and talk and that's all I need it to do. I've got a basic desktop here that I'm using. It's actually an eight-year-old computer screen and body, but last year the hard drive was kaput and we had to rebuild the hard drive. So it's basically a new computer brain with an old body. Um, you know, I have a, an MP3 player, but I don't, you know, listen to music through a smartphone. I have an old iTunes account, but, you know, I'm not one to just, like, jump into the latest technology. My sister sent me a Snapchat silly little snapchat video with the filter and a voice changer thing on it for my birthday and I was like wait a minute what'd you use to do that obviously it was your phone but what app so you know I'm not exactly the most technologically savvy person in the world but I'm not the least either I believe in a healthy mix of analog and digital and it's funny because in all my writing communities and notebook stationary communities it does strike me as interesting that we talk about fountain pens and paper and notebooks and things online. It is kind of a 
interesting thing there. But I always want to have a healthy mix of the old school with the new. So th I think that's why I collect notebooks and why I love stationery in general. Um, and it's why I'm excited that I can do these stationery uh, videos with Chloe. Yeah, I'm glad to see someone her age, she just turned 12, I'm glad to see someone her age still so enthusiastic about writing and instruments and notebooks and things, because a lot of 12 year olds, you know, it's all about the gadgets, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that, they're being born into, they've never known a world without technology, um, sadly I think my generation is going to be the last one who did, because I mean, like I said, we know, I, my family never had a computer before I was in 8th grade, and back when I was in elementary school, and Atari was like cutting-edge video games. You know, I mean, I played Pac-Man and Centipede until I wore the joysticks out on my Atari. But I think that my generation is the last one that can say that they were, you know, I mean, the Internet didn't come into vogue until I was in college. And that was the, you know, that was the 90s. <laughs> I graduated college in 97. And just as I was getting into college, that was when the Internet started taking off. And... You know, so my generation is going to be the last that wasn't totally born with access to technology. So I just, I think it's important to keep both alive. And there's room in your life for both. Just because you have a notebook or a favorite pen that you use doesn't mean you have to shun technology. I mean, I certainly haven't or I wouldn't be sitting here making this video. So I'm really enthusiastic and excited to see Chloe and her other friends who love stationery as much as she does being involved. And I hope you'll check out her videos. She's absolutely adorable. She's got the cutest little puppy named Daisy that's featured in a couple of her videos. And I'm looking forward to my next uh, collaboration. This is by far the longest video I've made yet, uh, going on 52 minutes here. But I could talk blue streak all day about all kinds of stationery, and I've been outlining some things that I want to discuss in future collaboration videos, and oh my gosh, I, there, I could make 20, 30 videos before I would try to need to think of something else to discuss. So I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you didn't mind my ramblings, and I will see you soon with some more stationery talk. Bye for now.